Welcome to the second day of the ninth annual Energy and Construction Best Practices Summit, hosted this year by five centers of excellence. Uh, the center directors are just rolling in. I think Linda Criar is in the back, Homeland Security Center of Excellence Director. We are the we that we talked about yesterday. How many of you were here yesterday? Awesome. And then how many of you are here just for today? So those that are here just for today, I'm assuming you've never been to one of our summits, right? All right. So welcome. Um, this is this is continues to be a great event. We bring clearly people from industry, labor, as well as our colleges from around the state and the region, and nationally in a lot of cases as well. So I'm going to introduce our trustee, Jim Lowry. So Jim, come on up. Jim's going to do the welcome on behalf of Centralia College and the Board of Trustees. But I have a little story with Jim. I got to work with Jim for three years under the Wired grant. So he was our project manager. And uh, it was three years, I think only once that we have a disagreement in three years. And that was be over the summit because I took his help to go get pizza with me. So, <laughs> but, but this is, my, my story went, so then he left the Center of Excellence and went to become uh, our board of, on our Board of Trustees. So I called him and left him a message and I said, you know that old adage, be good to your employees because you never know when they're going to be your boss? Well, just remember how good I was to you. So he continues over the last couple of years as trustee to, to help the centers, to work with our summit and all, all throughout the year. And if you notice, he was the one serving the beer last night. So Jim, come on up. Thank you, Barbara. I'll tell some stories about you in a little bit. Uh, on behalf of the Centralia College trustees and our president, Dr. Walton, welcome to Centralia campus. Uh, the facility you're in right now, I played basketball, did PE and gymnastics in this building in 1960, 61, and 62. It was actually the gymnasium for the Centralia High School, which was a three-story brick building back behind us here. And the only way you could get in was back here from the high school to the back end. Dr. Walton and uh, our leadership team at the college, uh, several, well, a few years ago now, were able to secure some money and we did a complete remodel, but we kept the integrity of the old gym. As you can see, the old rafters up here, uh, just to kind of keep the history of the place. Um, it's a great facility. Sometimes the acoustics aren't the best, but I think, can everybody hear me okay? Am I mumbling? I was trying like heck to do it. Um, and then as you go down to the Walton Science Center, notice the name of that, Walton, Dr. Walton. We actually got a request from the students' government last year uh, at one of our trustee meetings. Then they requested that we name the Science Center uh, after Dr. Walton. He's retiring at the end of this month and they wanted to honor him. Uh, they had that kind of a close relationship with our president, and I think that says a lot about our college. As you walk on our campus, you'll see a beautiful, beautiful campus. We're really very proud of it. I think what's happened is Jim Walton and his leadership has instilled a pride in this college. It's amazing. The maintenance crew keeps this place looking really good. Our faculty does well with our students. We have great student success. We serve the community the way a community college should. and. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a trustee for this organization, I can tell you that. It just gives you great pride to know that you're a part of it. Now, as you walk down to the Walton Science Center, I want you to take a look off to the left across from the Science Center, and there's an old building there. It's called, I think it's called the Health Science Annex or something like that. Uh, that's where I worked with Barbara for two years on a, a grant project. When they first told me about the job, uh, somebody said, well, they got this project called Wired. Well, being a product of the 60s, I thought, damn, that sounds like a good job. I think I'll try that. <laughs> well, as it turned out, it wasn't what I thought it was. It was an actual job, and they wanted me to work, and they paid me for it. So I did it for two years. I really enjoyed it. It was my first real close exposure to the Centers of Excellence concept. I had known about it. I'd been aware of it. But I really got to learn how the Center of Excellence concept works and not only did I get to know how the Center of Excellence for Energy Technology at that time worked, but I also got to meet the directors of the other 10 we had at that time. 
because Barbara sometimes couldn't make the meetings, so she'd send me. And I think Mike and I were the only two men. The rest were all women directors. It was a great experience. A lot of talented folks out there running these centers of excellence, which basically are geared towards workforce development of our primary industries in Washington State. And not only do they work with the host college they're at, but they also work with other colleges to make sure there's some workforce development for those particular industries. So it's, it's a concept that works really well, and we're really proud of it. But I want to tell you a little story about working with Barb. First of all, don't ever follow an agenda, because she'll change it halfway through anyway. <laughs> but I was sitting in my office one day, and I forget what I was doing, taking notes or doing something, making a report. Barb comes through the door, dragging a chair, because I didn't have chairs in my office, except the one I was sitting in. And she said, Jim, I need to pick your brain. I thought, oh boy, this is going to be fun. She sits down, she asks me a question, and then she answered it. And then she asked me another question, and she answered it. And she said, thanks, Jim, that was a lot of help, and walked back out to her other office. I don't, that was the easiest brain picking I've ever been through. I thought that was great. Um, welcome to Centralia College. We're really happy to have you here. Please enjoy your day. Also, take a walk around our campus and see how beautiful it is. And I hope you brought a wallet full of money because our downtown businesses would love to have you come down and visit them at the end of the day. We have some great restaurants, antique stores. It's a fun little town to walk through and spend a little money. Spend a lot of money, what the heck. It all comes back. Um, I wanted to end with a question. How many Centralia College energy students does it take to change a light bulb? Wow, no answers. It doesn't take any because they're smart enough to know to put in an LED light in the first place. <laughs> it's my pleasure now, well, before I introduce Dina, I want to introduce State Senator Marilyn Chase. Marilyn came yesterday to our conference and is here again today, and Marilyn, we really appreciate you showing up. Don't let Marilyn's grandmotherly look fool you. That, she's one tiger in the Senate, I'll tell you that. I'd like to introduce now uh, Dina Horton, who works for Senator Cantwell as the Southwest Washington Outreach Director. Senator Cantwell's been a great supporter of the Center of Excellence program. Uh, she, she believes, she met Barb a long time ago, saw the Center of Excellence for Energy Technology, and thought this was a model for the nation. And uh, she's been one of our strongest supporters, and Dina has a letter she'd like to read. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Dear friends, I would like to welcome you to the Cascadia Earthquake Readiness Workshop. Today's sessions will focus on preparing our communities for potential future large earthquakes in our region. Whether these earthquakes impact our region in 10 years or 100 years, the work you do today will help lay the foundation for mitigating these large-scale natural disasters and saving lives. Today's workshop can provide information about how to prepare for natural disasters and limit the lives lost, the property damaged, and the commerce disrupted. From improving the resiliency of our ports to understanding opportunities to minimize impacts to our energy infrastructure, today I commend you on sharing your best practices in your communities and helping other communities prepare for earthquakes and tsunamis. Thank you for visiting the Pacific Northwest Center of Excellence for Clean Energy to learn about how our communities can make a difference. I look forward to learning about policy recommendations and next steps generated by this symposium. With warmest regards, Maria Cantwell, United States Senator. Thank you. Now, besides welcoming you, I get to introduce your moderator for the day. I met Matt last night. He was in his casual attire. You didn't hit the bar very often, though, Matt. I guess that's because you knew you had to work today. Was that what it was? OK. Matt's with the Army Corps of Engineers and is the Critical Infrastructure Program Manager. And he's out of the Portland District. And Matt is going to be the one to keep you awake all day long and make sure that as you discuss earthquakes, there's not too much shaking and rolling going on. Matt, it's your job now, buddy. Take care, Matt. Thanks. 
Thanks very much, Jim. And thanks to all of you for attending today. It's great to see a room full of people that are worried like I am about a Cascadia earthquake. As you can see, there's a bunch of logos up there. And those logos represent the organizations that sponsored today's event. And they also represent a cross section of the industries that keep our region running. These are all part of the economic engine of the Pacific Northwest. And seeing all those logos together reminds me of the great amount of inter interdependency between the sectors of our economy. So keep that in mind as we go through our session today. I'd like to give a special thanks to Barbara Hintz Turner. She is the director of the Center of Excellence for Clean Energy. And about a year ago, she took me under her wing and shepherded me forward in working with a bunch of people to make today's event happen. And I'd also like to um, recognize Linda Carrar. Linda, she is the director of the Center of Excellence for Emergency Management and Homeland Security. And she and Paul McNeil have both been key members of planning this event and making it happen. Before I give you an overview of today's event, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about myself and why I'm standing up here. I was in the Coast Guard for over 31 years. During that time, I studied marine engineering, civil engineering, became a professional engineer, was involved in a lot of emergency management and facility maintenance, capital projects. And then four years ago, I started working for the Corps of Engineers as the Critical Infrastructure Program Manager for the Portland District. The Portland District has responsibility for more infrastructure than any other Corps of, Infra Corps of Engineers district. So we have a lot of things out there that we're trying to maintain and recapitalize. And I spend a lot of time worrying about all the things that could go wrong with our infrastructure that would prevent us from executing our mission. As president of the Portland Post of the Society of American Military Engineers, I felt a real need, a real desire to mobilize engineers to help better prepare our region for a Cascadia earthquake. In large part because of my role as critical infrastructure program manager for the Corps of Engineers, but also because I'm a father and a husband, and I'm concerned about the safety of my family and other families in the Northwest. So that's why I'm here today, so that we can have a safer, more resilient region. Next slide, please. So today, we got a little bit of a legislative perspective from the letter read by Dina Horton from Senator Cantwell. Thank you. After I finish a few slides, we're going to have an executive panel discussing the state of preparedness in our region. And then we're going to have some subject matter experts discuss the triple three resilience target. So what is this thing, the triple three resilience target? Well, it was recently proposed by Yume Wong and Kent Yu, and they worked very hard on the Oregon Resilience Plan. And as they were working on that plan, they thought about what kind of targets do we have for restoration of services? And they came up with three days to restore emergency services so that our emergency operations centers can be completely operational with power and water and communications and so that our fire stations and our police stations are operational, and so that our healthcare facilities, our hospitals and clinics are operational, because you know that after a Cascadia earthquake, we're gonna have some injuries. Well, in the state of Oregon, current estimates are that it will take us 18 to 36 months 
before our health care facilities can be up to the level where they're delivering services like they are today after a Cascadia earthquake. That's really scary. If you or someone you love has to have major surgery right after a Cascadia earthquake, you probably don't even want to wait three days for major surgery. You probably think that waiting three hours for major surgery is a long time. But right now that's our target. And then if you'll turn to page six in your program guide, on the bottom of page six is a version of this diagram. I typed that up and I made a mistake. I put three months in the program, three months to restore pre-disaster service levels. So cross out months and put weeks. And the reason that's three weeks is because from experience with Katrina and other emergencies and disasters, we found that if a, pri if a business doesn't operate for two to four weeks, if they cease operation for two to four weeks, after that, they're out of business. So we picked three weeks as our target to restore at least a level of services so that local economies can operate. Because if we don't meet that three-week target, we're going to see a lot of businesses go out of business. And then three years to improve our infrastructure so that we don't have to go through quite the level of mayhem that would occur if we had a Cascadia earthquake right now. So these are proposed targets, they're just proposals, they're discussion points. This is a big complicated issue and I realize that not everybody in this room is going to agree about everything that we discussed today. But this is a starting point for discussion and it will help us focus our thoughts on what we can do to better prepare our region for a Cascadia earthquake. Next slide, please. So this is the form that I've generated for each of our three session moderators to fill out so that at our report out session, we can kind of give you a list of the problems that we see keeping us from achieving the triple three resilience target and how we can address those problems. And then we can prioritize it. And as we prioritize, we need to think about how much does it cost? Does it cost a lot of money? Does it cost a little money? If it only costs a little bit of money and we can do it, let's do it. Then political capital. How much political capital do we need to execute a particular action? It may be very cheap, but it might be impossible to get through the legislature. On the other hand, it may be something that many people are behind in the political sense, but it's really expensive. And then the metrics means, can we measure our progress towards achieving that particular solution. So during the breakout sessions, I'm asking our moderators to use this to help focus the discussion. And I wanted to mention that for the past years we've been planning this, Barbara has said time and again, she doesn't want to have a talking head session all day long. What she wants, and what I would like to see, is that especially during our breakout sessions, we do have subject matter ex experts to be panelists during br each breakout session, but we are also very interested in the expertise, in the knowledge, in the experience that all of you bring to the table. And so during the breakout sessions, please speak up, make your opinions known, and the moderators will be capturing those opinions so that at the end of the day we can report to each other and I will also be drafting an article for the Military Engineer magazine to let the world, or at least the Military Engineer world, know about what we're doing here today. Next slide, please. So workshop outcomes. You know, I love to talk. You may not have noticed, but I love to talk. But there's a whole bunch more to life than talking. There's action. So today, the action that we're seeking is a prioritized action list so that we can get our region closer to meeting that triple three resilience target. So that 
well within three days, we can have those emergency services up, and well within three weeks, we can have our region capable of supporting economic activity. Because if we don't do it, our economic activity, which is also already going to be down here, is going to stay down. I know that many of you have worked very hard to make sure that our region is ready, prepared for, and can respond to a Cascadia earthquake. I know that some, Casc some earthquake plans right now, earthquake response plans, have deadlines like restore services as soon as possible. We need to do better than that. And so today we're going to talk about what we need to do to achieve the triple three resilience target. Our collective wisdom and efforts will help us move closer to the goal of a resilient Northwest. And although we can make significant progress today on this, it's going to take more than a few hours. And with that in mind, we plan to hold another Cascadia Resilience Workshop next year. And I hope that all of you will plan to attend that. The Founding Fathers pledged their lives, fortunes, and honor to each other. I want you to pledge your time and energy to work with us before that year is up so that when we gather in a year, we can make measurable progress towards a more resilient Northwest. Now you've got a quick introduction to the triple three resilience target. And we are going to hear now from these three executives in our region who are at the forefront of preparing for and responding to a Cascadia earthquake and any other kind of emergency that comes up. Each one is going to give us a 10-minute assessment of Cascadia earthquake preparedness in their own agency and in their area of operations, along with some insight into what they are doing to improve readiness for a major earthquake and tsunami. So our first speaker this morning will be Patrick Massey. From the federal, he is the Federal Preparedness Coordination, Coordinator and Director of the National Preparedness Division, FEMA Region 10. Mr. Massey has served in FEMA Region 10 since 1996, and before he joined FEMA, he served as a planner with the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, and also served as a flood recovery planner for regional planning in Illinois. Mr. Massey. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I mean, we have a Ken Murphy, regional administrator. Uh, he sends his greetings. He would like to be here, but um, he's out and about on travel. Um, so I'm going to focus my uh, comments on, um, um, on the response phase of operations, right? Um, particularly what FEMA is doing in our planning for a Cascadia subduction zone tsunami and earthquake, uh, working with our state partners, talk about some of the challenges, some of the uh, some of the issues we're going to be facing, the general parameters of our plan, um, and what we're kind of hoping to accomplish. I'm not going to talk about um, some issues that relate, you know, uh, to hazard mitigation and that sort of thing, resiliency, um, which I think is kind of the theme of your, of your conference here. Um, I know the states um, have done a lot of work in their mitigation plans and their strategies um, over the last couple of years are very sophisticated, so I'm hoping me and my colleagues will address some of those issues. Over the last several years, there's been a big push in our institution to focus on preparations for the big disasters, right? The level one, large scale, the catastrophic disasters. So in our doctrine, when we talk about disasters, we have level three, level two, level one. Level three, kind of your garden variety disaster, doesn't take a lot of federal resources. On the recovery side, it's a lot. On the response, not too much. Level two disasters, a little bit more sophisticated, more widespread damage. There may be deaths or maybe some request for support, for help from, from the state uh, emergency management offices. Um, those are a little bit more common, but not too common. And there's a level one disasters, right? The large scale of the catastrophic disasters. These don't occur very often in our country, right? Maybe once or twice a decade. 
probably Hurricane Sandy was a level one disaster. You may have to go back to Hurricane Katrina to find the last one. But those are the wickedly complicated wide area disasters, and certainly that's what CSE would be. Um, so in 2009, FEMA, working with our state partners, undertook a uh, pretty comprehensive planning effort to focus on Cascadia, Cascadia subduction zone um, and the consequences of that in Washington and Oregon and how the federal interagency is going to support the states uh, to try to stabilize the incident and save lives and respond. Um, so we did some, like anything, a good plan. We did our risk analysis first, a very sophisticated modeling of the impacts to critical infrastructures, so on and so forth. And I know a lot of you know this data, but it, just a couple of points, to, a couple of issues to point out to set the stage. Um, from our modeling of the percent of critical infrastructure that would be moderately to, to completely damaged, uh, things like seaport facilities, 88%, uh, um, wastewater treatment facilities, 77%, um, electric power, power facilities, 58%, uh, bridges, 25%. So it gives you a scale of the problem that we're going to face in the here and now in a big CSE event. Um, and of course, when that event happens, it's going to be the first time probably in our country's history, right, where we're going to have a lot of critical infrastructure that's crumpled, which we've never really faced before. We've only had kind of sophisticated um, you know, all the pipelines, if it's natural gas, wastewater treatment, um, fiber optic cable, and so forth, you know, 50 years or 70 years. So we've never really been tested in that space. Um, it's not going to be like a hurricane, statement of the obvious, right? You know, we have three or four days to see it coming. We can prepare. It's going to happen, and we've got to be ready to, to, to roll. Um, we're worried, of course, um, about, you know, uh, the troika of doom, as we describe, right? It's the power, it's electricity, it's fuel, it's transport and that weird negative feedback you get into. So you lose two of those three systems, you, you know, it's a manageable problem. If all three go down, right, you've got a, you've got a, um, it's a, it's a major problem. You saw that in Hurricane Sandy, um, you know, for a couple of weeks, we were in that feedback loop, right? We didn't have power for the gas station pumps to get fuel, transport was cut off, so you couldn't get, you know, uh, power crews to actually repair the, the uh, power infrastructure. So breaking that um, um, is going to be a major effort for us to do. Of course, Camo is king, and that's kind of, you know, the, the whole, whole sort of enabler of what we do. Um, Com's going to be down. So we have a lot of challenges, a lot of the stuff you know. Um, so briefly, our plan that we coordinate very strongly with Oregon Emergency Management in Washington, um, I'll give you kind of the wave top level brief of how it's going to sort of unfurl. Um, so our doctrine, um, has us in any disaster, any large-scale disaster, setting up incident support bases and then federal staging areas to move response teams and commodities. So, so a level one disaster, certainly CSE, right? It's all about access and it's about resources. It's logistics and it's, and it's access. That's kind of our phase two-way operations and I'll talk to that in a second. To set up two ISBs um, east of the Cascades, one in Washington, one in Oregon, that will flood with resources, uh, teams, commodities, the stage with transport links to the rest of the country, and then the jump to the west of the Cascades, I-5 corridor and the coast, um, to set up FSAs, federal staging areas. We're in a normal disaster. We, we'd set up these, these, these massive mega FSAs. Our doctrine is going to shift for CSE. We have a lot of island populations. We'll be setting up a lot of type 3 FSAs, very small federal staging areas, but a lot of them in Washington, coordinating with the state state of Oregon um, to move supplies and resources into. Um, and refined fuels is going to be a problem. You know, the 460,000 barrels a day of refined fuels that go through the Kinder Morgan pipeline and the pumps and the 32 terminals are not going to be, behave well, we don't think. Um, so it's going to give us a big challenge. Um, for many of you out there are going to be responders in this in some capacity, and I'll talk to that in assessment in your role. Um, and a big thing that we find in these disasters, we just came out of a big exercise in Alaska for seven days. We did a lot of things not, not too well in our findings, but one was our capacity or our lack of capacity, right, to sustain the force. So we're going to have all these responders flooding in to this operational area in the two states from all over the place. Local responders under EMAC that the state will coordinate, federal responders, people in the private sector, electricity and commo, that are coming in, tens of thousands of people, 
um, and we're not in the first days and weeks going to have the capability to sustain them, right? So um, first responders, all the responders, they need to come prepared to sustain themselves, right? You're not going to roll in right to some forest, sophisticated forest service base camp, you know, with a stack of pancakes and, and hot showers. It's not going to happen at least for a first couple of weeks. So it's very important to know that. It's going to be pretty gruesome for the responders, and you're going to have to go it, go it alone as far as um, taking care of yourselves and your teams. Um, our plan two happens in uh, February, right? So we're not going to have heat, right? Natural gas is gone. It's going to be a big mass care problem. Big mass care problem in Sandy. Had a big hurricane, and then a week later it snowed, right? It was a bad scene, and a lot of people didn't have heat, didn't have power. It was a huge mass care problem. Um, so, the, so the main response tasks, and um, our plan is organize, organized around the 14 response core capabilities, if you're familiar with those. Um, I won't go, th go through all of them, but so the high points are um, on the mass care services, right, the estimate that about a million people are going to need to be sheltered, right? Eight million people in the corridor, eight million shelter. A lot of those will be able to hopefully stay with neighbors, and friends, but a lot are going to need congregate care centers. Um, so you can imagine the load um, to staff and care for all those people. Um, over two million people are going to need some sort of feeding and hydration services, right? You're going to lose potable water. Uh, so millions of our citizens, we're going to have to provide potable water and food to. Um, of course, I'm, um, I'm warning public info and warning. Um, we're going to have a lot of issues. Um, because public messaging in big disasters is critically important to notify the public, the states, local governments, um, and not having television, not having the internet and social media is going to put a lot of restraints about how we notify people of how to get services and so forth. It's going to cause a lot of rumors, which is really going to shape um, a lot of what we do and not in a good way. Um, so infrastructure systems, which I know a lot of you out there care about, um, so what are the major roles and functions in the response for in infrastructure system? So in our plan, like kind of a military S plan, kind of broken down into phases. So phase 1A are kind of the shaping functions. It's not response. That's all the stuff that the states and stuff are doing, what you're doing um, on, you know, on the hazard mitigation front, resiliency front. Could be planning, training, and exercising. Could be strengthening infrastructures, right? That's kind of phase one shaping. What you're doing here today, it's wickedly important. So, uh, so phase 2A um, is simply to deploy resources in the theater to get them to the ISBs as quickly as possible. Phase 2B um, is about assessments, right? And that's what a lot of you um, are going to be tasked with doing in some capacity, whether you're a private sector person, you're working for the Army Corps of Engineers and ESF3, or you're a public servant or whatever, we're going to have to we're going to have to assess the critical infrastructure, the status of the infrastructure, what's broken and how, how bad it is, right? So that's a big uh, mission that all of you are, are going to be involved with. Um, many other folks out there work for the Corps of Engineers. They're PRTs under ESF3, right? They're planning response teams that a lot of you know about. So prime power, electricity, generators, that's going to be a huge mission. And we, we've teed up a lot of these things through a thyra process with the core of the litany of generators we're going to need, and it is, it is awesome. Um, things like the blue roof tarps. A lot of you have been on hurricane responses, right? And you got the blue roof teams for the core and their contractors that try to get, you know, people lose their, their roofs, and they get out there and they slap the blue tarp on there to protect their homes. We're going to need a lot of that in earthquakes, too. We've kind of teed up this problem. So, um, so a lot of people, we're going to try to shelter people in their homes. We can't afford to set up, you know, 8,000 shelter operations. We can't staff it, can't maintain it. There's going to be a big, big push. People shelter in place. We've seen in earthquakes a lot of times, even in the Squally in 2001, a small one, a lot of the chimneys kind of, er, they move. So even if their foundation is set, their chimney comes, so you've got to get blue rooftops. So things you would think in a hurricane that you would never think, why would you need that in an earthquake, are actually going to be quite critical in, in earthquake response and restoration. Um, and of course, you know, the power utility crews and getting them in, right? Um, on electricity crews, uh, telecommunications. So for instance, in, in Hurricane Sandy alone, I know that under an admission assignment from FEMA that the Department of Defense flew in um, 400 electricity um, 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 
on the power restoration vehicles to the East Coast, right? Put them on strategic airlift, and that was a huge lift for DOD just to, you know, just to get those power utility vehicles from the West Coast of the United States, organize them, and get them to New Jersey and New York. Um, in CSE, that's going to be one thing of a pantheon of things that we're going to rely on our DOD partners to perform. Um, so the big, and the big takeaway I have for CSE is that um, you know, the resiliency work that you're doing and the, and the phase one shaping functions are important. Um, and I think we're all on the dais hoping we can buy a little time until it happens, because it will happen, right? It's geologically inevitable. It's not like a nuclear bomb or we're unsure of the probability. The probability of CSZ is 100%. Um, so hopefully it'll happen a generation or two from now in the interim space. We can all uh, strengthen systems, so when it happens, it'll be, uh, it'll be a manageable problem and not a, a social and economic catastrophe. So was that eight minutes? That was, was great. Eight minutes? Thank you very much, right. Mr. Messi. Appreciate it. Our next, our next speaker is Mr. Robert Izell, Director of the Washington Military Department's Emergency Management Division. Mr. Izell became Director of the Washington Military Department's Emergency Management Division in 2013. He joined the division in October 2010. Before that, he spent nearly 17 years in the Washington Air National Guard and 13 years as a fighter pilot, pilot trainer, and operations officer in the U.S. Air Force, flying F-4 and F-15 fighters. Mr. Rizal. Good morning, everyone. I just uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk about a, uh, a topic that I'm very passionate about. And, uh, the Cascadia scenario is one of the biggest things that causes me to lose sleep at night because we know that the impacts of that are just going to devastate our region, not just here in Washington State, but Oregon, uh, Northern California, British Columbia. But before I get into what we in Washington State are doing to prepare, I want to take us back about uh, three months to the morning of March 22nd when there was a landslide in, in Snohomish County, in Oso, happened with absolutely no warning. 43 lives were lost. And while that event may not rise to the level of a, of a level of one event that Pat was talking about, it was certainly catastrophic for the impacted communities. It was catastrophic for the county, and really it was catastrophic for the, for the state itself. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Even though it, it was small, local response was, uh, was overwhelmed very quickly. County uh, ability to be able to put together its emergency management structures was overwhelmed very quickly. and. Uh, Literally hundreds of people from across the state came in and supported Snohomish County and their emergency operations center and then the incident management team to help the county and the locals deal with that event. Many of the things that uh, Pat talked about in terms of what we will have to deal with in a large event, we had to deal with on a very small event. The problems of setting up command and control the problems of uh, feeding and caring for the first responders out there in the field, the public messaging and making sure that the public information was, uh, was correct. Uh, and I could go on and on and on. And uh, you know, the, the state and the, the county and the locals, I think, uh, performed extremely well in, in responding to this, but there are some tremendous lessons learned that we can gain from this that will apply in a catastrophic scenario. Now, take that landslide that covered about a square mile of, uh, of ground and the 43 lives that were lost and increase that by several orders of magnitude to where we have landslides like that occurring across the region to where we have uh, buildings destroyed, where we have uh, bridges down, power out, 
uh, any critical infrastructure or u utilities sector that you can think of are, are down and severely impacted. And you can see how the, that little situation can rapidly cascade uh, across, the, across the region with one of these larger type events. And uh, we really, truly are going to have our hands full as locals, as a state, and as a nation dealing with that, uh, that type of situation. I want to go into a couple more of the, the things that we're looking at. And uh, essentially, uh, let's talk power. We're all dependent on it. You know, we need it to power our communications, to power our homes, to power all those things that, uh, you know, maintain our quality of life. You know, that's going to that's gonna be gone relatively quickly. Uh, you know, the, we're going to lose our distribution systems, uh, the towers are going to be down, lines are going to be down across the region. Power is going to be gone. But without power, what else do we lose? You know, I, I've already mentioned communications, but what about the uh, ability to uh, manage water, to manage sewage? to distribute and, and pump fuel, just to name a few things. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to have to deal with all that. Then how do you get resources and supplies and things to where they need to be? We're going to have hundreds of bridges across the, the region damaged. You know, the coast is going to be cut off. We're, we're essentially going to be dealing in islands of, uh, of population where communities are going to have to be self-sustaining for a period of time until we can get help to them. Um, we've talked about communications are going to be bad, going to get worse as uh, backup generators fail on cell towers, as networks are overwhelmed, as satellite bandwidth is uh, basically being used up by all the folks who you know, need that capability to be able to communicate. Uh, Pat's already talked about the, the requirements for shelter, health care capacity is going to be reduced because uh, of damage to hospitals and uh, clinics and lack of critical uh, utilities. So, you know, there's going to be second and third order effects flowing from all of this. And so it's a disaster that's going to touch all of community and it's going to require all of community to respond. But also, as we look at how do we prepare for it, how do we build resiliency, it needs to be an all of community effort as we look at how do we build resiliency. So what have we been doing? Um, both Washington and Oregon have been working very closely with Region 10 on the development of common plans. But again, there's not enough of everything. There's not enough technicians, engineers, firefighters, EMT, terminal workers, clean water, food, building inspectors, emergency per management personnel. You know, how do we bring it all together? We're going to have trouble communicating, coordinating our efforts, so we need to put into place, and we are working on the plans to do that normal ways that we respond to disasters are not going to be sufficient because the resources that we depend on, the, the roads, the employees, the gas stations, are not going to be there. People we call on may not be answering their phones. They may be at home taking care of their families. And so, you know, how are we going to work if half of our or two-thirds of our workforce isn't able to make it into work? And it's requiring us to take a look at, you know, are there different ways that we can we can put together an emergency management uh, system that doesn't necessarily require all of us to be in a room in a fixed uh, facility. How can we partner virtually with the limited communications that, uh, that we have to provide some capability in the first uh, hours and days after response until we can get emergency management centers up and, uh, up and running? You know, one thing's clear, we're going to respond and recover by the combined and coordinated actions of many, many people throughout society and by every level of government, by our tribal nations, by private industry, by um, city and county emergency managers, by businesses, organizations, like I said, whole of society. And as we look out to all of you who are going to play a key role in this, we're going to be looking to you to be able to get your operations up as quickly uh, and uh, as effectively as you can in uh, a minimum amount of time possible. It's also clear that, um, you know, there's going to be a governmental role in, in preparing for this. And so 
we in Washington are working to bring all of uh, the elements of, uh, of society together to start looking at this, uh, at this problem. We're kind of peeling back an enormous uh, onion, so to speak. So here's some things that we've, we've done and specifically. The Seismic Safety Commission of the Emergency Management Council has produced Resilient Washington, which is a framework for minimizing loss and improving statewide recovery after a catastrophic earthquake. The framework provides 10 broad recommendations addressing areas such as school seismic safety, business continuity, transportation resiliency, hospital resiliency, and further developing the knowledge of seismic hazards in Washington State. The broad framework provides a starting point to develop specific plans to improve resilience in each of the targeted areas. While ambitious, it's not something that we're going to do overnight. We're looking at, at this plan being something that's going to take decades to implement, and we're working on trying to pull together a framework to begin planning for and taking concrete actions within each of those 10 targeted areas. At the Emergency Management Division, we have a full-time function to plan for a catastrophic disaster, and we're developing plans that are general and flexible, but which form the basis for coordinating plans with our partners. We've published an annex to the State Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, which outlines basic requirements for effective uh, response to a catastrophic disaster. We've identified over 30 potential options to facilitate response by the whole community, save lives, and uh, prepare a strong economy. We've coordinated for many years with the Puget Sound Regional Catastrophic uh, Planning Group under a grant from FEMA. And that planning group consists of the eight counties surrounding the Puget Sound. And they put into place a, a number of plans. And we're looking at ways that we can take the great work that that group has done and then start expanding that out to our coastal communities, the remainder of the uh, I-5 corridor and then even to Eastern Washington. And yes, we are looking at Eastern Washington as having effects and being a partner to our, our preparation and response activities to a catastrophic disaster. We have for years and will continue to reach out to tribal nations in the state and have active programs coordinating with many of their emergency management uh, planning groups. The Washington National Guard is developing detailed plans to rapidly and broadly establish a logistical network within days of a major earthquake in the area. They're also planning to coordinate the full range of Department of Defense resources to dispatch to Washington in order to help implement the governor's priorities. We've asked the Navy to be prepared to support our coastal communities, and they're currently making plans to do so, though they'll not necessarily be the first on the scene. This disaster will affect the entire state of Washington, and we've just recently started a group whose purpose it is to convey the plans and response templates for disaster throughout the state. This scenario has also caused uh, uh, or uh, resulted in a number of significant efforts in a number of state agencies. And for example, the Department of Transportation has been reinforcing freeway bridges for a number of years and has coordinated with a regional alternate route planning effort for the Puget Sound Catastrophic uh, Grant Region. Department of Health has been working closely with their federal partners in uh, the Health and Human Services Administration on providing emergency medical teams and other resources. So all of state government is involved and are looking at uh, plans and we're just uh, working with them to make sure those plans are coordinated across the community. We also have uh, various partnerships uh, and uh, are reaching out to, uh, to other groups in the area. In particular, the Pacific Northwest Economic Region uh, is sponsoring exercises and conferences throughout the Pacific Northwest, including with our neighbors focused on sustaining marine ports. However, as ambitious as our planning efforts are, a lot of it comes down to resources. Emergency management uh, uh, staffs at all levels of government are fully engaged in a myriad of preparedness activities. Catastrophic planning is just one of them. As budgets tighten, agencies are finding it increasingly difficult to provide baseline emergency management uh, functions. In addition, building resilience is expensive. We do not and probably never will live in a time of unlimited resources where we can just throw money at, uh, at any problem that we see. And that's why we need all of community and frankly all of your help in carrying the message that building resilience is crucial and is a necessary uh, investment 
not only from government, but also from private industry. We've been working diligently with an expanding roster of governments and communities throughout Washington to improve our preparedness for uh, this catastrophic event. We're not there yet. It's going to take years to implement and exercise the plans we have, and we're building additional plans. But with uh, every effort, such, such as this conference, we move closer and are that much more prepared. So I just thank you for being here. I thank you for taking this seriously. And we really, truly look forward to working with you and hearing the ideas and the priorities that come out of the breakaway sessions this afternoon. So thank you. I really appreciate what you all are doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Izzell. Our next speaker is Mr. David Stuckey, who is director of the Oregon Office of Emergency Management. Mr. Stuckey was appointed as director of OEM in May of 2013, and before that he served as deputy director for several years. He joined the Office of Emergency Management following a 25-year career in the Oregon Army National Guard, where he retired as a colonel. Mr. Stuckey? Well, good morning. Thank you. Appreciate being here today. Uh, great state of Washington. Certainly, if I wasn't in Oregon, this would be my second choice. And so, uh, actually, I should ask this before I say that. How many are from Oregon? How many live? Oh, a third, maybe even 40% maybe even are from Oregon. Fantastic. Uh, certainly glad to be here today, uh, be on this, uh, this platform. I knew it being at the tail end of this uh, uh, panel uh, behind Matt, Pat, and Robert that I'd probably get screwed out of time. So, so this is what we can do. I can talk faster, or I can talk less topics. And so I want to zero in. Uh, I'm going to choose the latter. Uh, certainly nice to be here in the hub, state, uh, hub city of uh, Centralia. Uh, nice to see Portland Trailblazer fans up here. Um, and so what I'd like to do is talk and zero in just a little bit on, on Oregon. Um, very educated audience here. Uh, you are professionals. You know exactly what you're doing. Um, we tend to, in emergency management, on the preamble, talk about how bad it's going to be and then, and then basically try and do the call for action. Uh, you know that. Uh, we've had some highlights here today of how bad Cascadia is going to be and the effect and how long it's going to take to recover from that. Um, I don't need to continue that theme any longer. I think it was highlighted very well, but I want to start with some things that Oregon is doing uh, to better prepare. Uh, first in the planning effort. And it's basically two phases here, planning and then education. In the planning effort, we have um, an extension to our, our emergency operations plan. And, and Pat mentioned right up front that we, in 2009-10-11, um, we had this extensive Cascadia planning effort threat followed by operational planning. And so my adjutant general, a uh, new boss, came in on 1 August of uh, this past year, said that's not good enough. Um, and like Robert, he's a pilot. Uh, for those that don't know pilots, they like checklists. And they like them right in their lap. And my boss said, Dave, I want a playbook. I want a playbook where I can say, here's step one, here's step two, this is how we're going to do it. And I want it in some great fidelity. And I, and I want it um, done in three months. And then this is going to be a three to five year plan. And we're going to take this playbook beyond um, uh, just the Office of Emergency Management, we're going to go to ES, the ESFs, and we're going to go to these counties and cities. And they said, oh my god. Okay, boss, we'll do it. So uh, we did it. Uh, we have the Cascadia playbook. Uh, we're going to do a rollout event here. This is just the working draft. This is step one of the process uh, that we're going to be uh, rolling out. I think our governor somewhere around middle of July, end of July, around the 23rd maybe. It's tentative. We'll do a rollout event with our governor and others on the Oregon coast. I think it's going to be Lincoln City at the Marine Hatfield Center. And basically what, what the Cascadia playbook is, is this, this compilation of all the existing plans and structures that existed, pulling out the federal uh, execution matrix. Uh, for those that haven't seen Pat's federal execution matrix, how many tasks? 1,400? I think it's worse than that. <laughs> is it worse than that? We went through every single one of them. How, where's the placeholder for everything that we need to get done? We looked at existing plans from Washington, from Oregon, et cetera. So basically, this is just a framework of response. Uh, we, um, or a punch list. We've, it's just 
uh, focused on from the initial call to action uh, and the disaster all the way through to uh, the recovery stage, basically five uh, correction, nine plans. And so we're excited about this. It's going to be a huge endeavor to continue this. Uh, we're rolling it out with state agencies now for, uh, and then uh, recreating our ESF structures from 15 to 18, which is uh, extensive and and has caused some level of concern but we want to we believe that the 18 ESF structure will give us a, a greater level of, of planning effort and then from there we're going to move on to our counties and, and cities um, so three to five years from now will we have the response plan the playbook the punch list or checklist we'll see what happens uh, but we're gonna we're gonna uh, certainly put in a great effort in trying to do that our next uh, planning effort uh, is tsunami evacuation and, and route wayfinding. And so uh, working through uh, uh, NOAA grant, the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation uh, Program grant and others, uh, we're trying to rethink how we do evacuation route planning. How many of you have seen the sign with the nice surfing wave um, up and down your coast? Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Tohoku EQ, uh, March 2011, uh, up and down the coast, seven coastal counties, checking in with all the counties, and about um, 10 o'clock in the morning, I had a commissioner out of one county call up and said, Dave, we've got a problem. We, need to, uh, we have some people that are going, running to the coast. And I said, what do you mean? Well, they're going to the coast with surfboards. <laughs> and he said, that, that can't be true. He goes, yeah, they think there's an actual wave coming, and they want to surf it. And so, so there are some things that we probably need to rethink in how we're doing signage. Uh, and, and how um, the routes are planned, multi-sensory, compatible with some local aesthetics. Uh, we have a charrette coming up here in July, uh, end of July, and then we have a report due. And so uh, we're working with the Oregon Portland Urban Architecture and Research Lab. We're uh, working with Dagami, our research arm at state government in the state of Oregon. And so, so hopefully that could help create a broader perspective of, of how we do evacuation uh, route planning as well as um, as well as signage. Another project that we're working on is, is the coastal uh, island mapping. And that's, again, funded through our, our partners at FEMA uh, through the Na uh, National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. And this is a partnership with Lane County Community College. And basically what we're trying to do is, is through the hazard mapping, et cetera, is, is figure out where our islands are post the tsunami, post the big one. Uh, worst case scenario, where, where are there islands that exist up and down the coast and how do we include that in our operational planning, in our, in our visualization tools. Oregon has a tool called Raptor, a, a real-time assessment type of tool that's, that it helps provide that clarity. And so what we want to do is, is, is just be able to have that greater level of, of fidelity up and down the coast. And so we're excited about that. On the education and training arena, this will never stop. It'll never, ever stop. We, um, big picture, the state of Oregon, our legislature from the 13th session uh, created a bill and a task force. I'm a member of that task force where we will, uh, we will look at both the education training component as well as critical infrastructure and basically two broad perspectives. This task force has to report back to the Oregon legislature in October of this coming year or this year. And so we have 17 members on that. The chair of our, our uh, task force is Dr. Ashford uh, out of Oregon State. Is there Beaver fans in the, in the house? Oh. Um, and so we have uh, Dr. Ashfield leading that great uh, endeavor. And so from our standpoint, there's going to be a, a number of initiatives that come out of that. We're hoping that our legislature will provide a greater level of, of funding and appropriation and focus to get us moving in the in both the education training arena as well as the critical infrastructure we too as robert mentioned in oregon department of transportation has their own um, process for uh, assessing route planning as well as at phase one and phase two seismic retrofitting bridges there's not enough to go around there's not enough money to go around there's not enough time to go around and we got to get better at it and so uh, we're trying to take a long-term approach to this. And so this task force hopefully will create another level of, of enthusiasm and motivation, particularly with the state legislature. So uh, an unabashed plug for those that live in Oregon, uh, please talk to your uh, legislative members uh, and, and uh, ask them about and support that task force resiliency uh, uh, report that's going to be doing in October, and more importantly, uh, what 
uh, we can do as a state to help uh, provide greater level of appropriation and focus, and it goes much beyond OEM. Last thing I want to cover, uh, the Oregon shakeout. Um, for the two tables right here next to the Proxima, I hope you don't believe in the triangle of life because those 200 pound speakers above you, I, my recommendation is duck cover and hold. And so on the 16th of October at 1016, so 1016, 1016, uh, we will have their shakeout. It's a collaborative effort up and down. Please, please, please uh, get people to, to uh, aware of that. I'm only gonna do one plug on personal preparedness uh, and I'm not gonna ask you the question, but I would expect in this audience with this education level and, and uh, what they expect to see uh, now and in the future that everyone here is personally prepared. Uh, please ensure that, uh, that you follow through with that and that you help push that with your, uh, with your fellow neighbors. And remember, you guys have a choice today whether or not you want to be a victim tomorrow. So with that, thank you very much for being here today. And, uh, and I'll turn it back over to Matt. Thank you very much, Mr. Stuckey. And thanks to all three members of our executive panel. It's obvious that all three of you are working very hard with your agencies to promote readiness for a Cascadia earthquake, and that you have significant resources devoted to improving that readiness. I especially like the mention of personal preparedness. When I started working on this workshop about a year ago with Barbara, one of my dinnertime conversation topics with my lovely bride was, I've got a workshop conference call tomorrow. We're planning this thing, and it's very important. And after a couple weeks of that, Ellen says to me, so you're setting up a workshop. You're having lots of conference calls. How about our own personal readiness? And I said, hmm. Well, it's a really big problem and I don't know where to start. So what I did was, every time I went to the grocery store, I bought two gallons of water, and they're in my garage, a whole bunch of gallons of water now. And I talked to a buddy of mine who says, you know, Matt, you can buy a 4,500 watt generator on Amazon for $330. 330 bucks. Is having electricity at your house worth 330 bucks? It's free delivery. And I don't work for Amazon. <laughs> so there are many things that you can do. And the one that I'm most excited about is this thing called a life straw. And I don't work for life straw either. But life straw is this thing about the size of this microphone. $19.99. And with a life straw, once you filter the big chunks out of water, you can get enough water to live for an entire year. So if it actually does take a year to get our water treatment plants back in order, if you have a life straw and you have access to water, you're going to be OK. And you all know how, how long you can go without water, right? Not very long. So thanks again, gentlemen. Really appreciate it.